All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, this is a quick video which corresponds to MRAP. We talked a little bit about uh, tuberculosis, and I said we'd throw up a quick, very quick video about the uh, chest X-ray and some tuberculosis-like findings. I've got with me here Stuart Swadron, who actually knows this stuff. I only know it in the most basic of detail, but he's a real doctor. So here's the key points that I wanted to make, is that TB is a dynamic disease. I think you don't sort of know that. You get infected, and some stuff might happen, and then uh, you go into a latency phase, and then it might come back. And there are different uh, classic... Uh, manifestations on the uh, chest x-ray that you might find at various times. Remember that you know about 15% of the time when you first get infected with tuberculosis, you'll have no chest x-ray findings. It may be even higher than that, particularly in some HIV populations. And TB can pretty much look like everything. This, this is what I was told by my radiology attendings, you know, 35 years ago. Uh, I can put up any x-ray and it could be TB. I just want you to know. So uh, here is what I would say is sort of a classic thing that I think about with TB. Here is a, a chest x-ray which shows that there's a big uh, opacity goomba in the left upper lobe. Is that consistent with TB? Absolutely. And uh, the thing that most of us remember, aside from that one dictum that you mentioned, which is that anything is consistent with TB, we used to actually have to close our eyes and repeat that as a mantra, <laughs> I believe, in school. Any x-ray, sir, is consistent with TB. But... Uh, most people that we see TB in, it's going to be reactivation, mm -hmm. okay? It's going to be the kind that uh, comes back after an initial uh, infection, which is nascent. And uh, it usually comes back in the upper zones. And remember, that was thought to be because of the concentration of oxygen being higher up there. Mm -hmm. It likes those areas with high concentration. And specifically, when we're looking at that upper lobe uh, infiltrate, we're looking for cavitation. And mm -hmm. often if you look, you can see that there's actually a cavity, usually not fluid filled, usually just a, a hollow cavity. And sometimes those cavities uh, become the site of super infections with other things like fungi. So tell us, just take us through them very quickly. I've got tuberculosis, you don't. Right. <coughs> You cough Have on me, some. and so red what sees all these red snappers, they come into me, and they go down my respiratory tract, and um, what happens is my immune system actually Assuming goes, it, it's it goes to war, it goes to war, <laughs> it's, it's robust, and it goes to war against these, uh, these red snappers, and it tries to wall them off, and uh, the remnants of that reaction are visible often on an x-ray, you can s often see a little complex, they call it a GOM complex, uh, where that little battle royale took place, and often there'll be little calcifications in the media sign of your patients that are older, they come from uh, areas where TB was very prevalent when they were younger, maybe the immigrant population, mm -hmm. some of our native population, it's very common, um, urban, inner city population, right, all these populations and so sometimes you'll even see the radiologists will comment you know what i bet you this patient had tb in the past because mm -hmm. there's all these little little calcified granulomata that indicate that that past battle if you will mm -hmm. in the immune system and then what happens uh do you kill them all then, or why does it sometimes so, come back? What's so it's one of those things that's kind of like you've walled it off and you've got it under control, but it's still there, you know. Mm. And so someone who gets really sick with cancer or they get immunocompromised because of HIV AIDS or chemotherapy, you name it, and those things especially uh, are uh, an excuse, if you will, for the bugs to come back out and when they do come back out they can cause all kinds of other nastiness they can cause things that look just like regular pneumonia they can actually circulate all the way through your blood bloodstream and they can uh, cause tb in the uterus in the epididymis in the bones and that's basically what happens to a lot of people so uh when i first coughed on you and you had this fight sometimes you lose the fight right and you get a big pneumonia and you get really sick sometimes you wall it off and then you reactivate it later can i kill every can i win the fight once and rule the first time? That's, a really, that's an amazing question. That's an excellent question. So, so young people that are exposed to TB, they'll have a positive skin test to show that they've been exposed to it, and they might have on the x-ray some of these things that shows that there was something once upon a time there. Um, those patients can reduce the risk that they're going to come down with the clinical TB by taking medications to kill what's left. It doesn't usually kill at all, hmm. but it, it kills enough that it brings the, the risk that you're going to reactivate down to a much much lower level and that's why when we we convert in the hospital when we're exposed to tb unless there's something else uh, wrong with us if we're reasonably young and we don't have liver disease and other things that make the medicines a problem we take those medicines for a long time to cut down the load of tb that's in our body reduce the chance of reactivation you know we're supposed to be talking about x-ray findings but i think you've got to understand some of that sort of underlying pathophysiology to know what happens next. So here's an x-ray which could be completely consistent with uh, tuberculosis. It's a lower lobe pneumonia, and so this could be sort of part of the primary infection that you got. 
Is this this, this is, I mean, this could not, this is the main event, right? This could not be more important because this is the pitfall. When someone comes in with some history of TB and we see that there's something in the upper zone or they have symptoms that are suggestive of TB, you know, they've been sweating and losing weight and it's months and they've got a risk factor and you see something in the upper zone, everyone's thinking TB, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the problem. When someone comes in sick with pneumonia that we don't know from Adam, uh, we have to think about TB because it could just mimic a regular bad pneumonia. It could look like an ammonia with an effusion and that absolutely could happen as the first manifestation of infection, especially if you're HIV positive or mm -hmm. uh, AIDS or you uh, have some compromise, uh, you're more likely to go straight into what looks like, for all extents, for all uh, other purposes, a lower low pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's do uh, the next one. Is this part of that sort of calcification thing you were talking about? The, yeah, I think the it, bugs come in yeah. and you get a little calcified. This is the kind of thing you might see. Stuff here, exactly. Yeah. You know? So that could be consistent with a prior exposure to tuberculosis. All right. So uh, what about uh, this thing? So it looks like we might have like a little middle lobe thing going on here, um, something happening here. But then you've got, again, like the first x-ray we showed, there's something happening in the upper lobe. And then you talked about, you can see inside this circle, there's another circle that doesn't have an air fluid level, but that's pretty consistent with TB. Yeah, I think most of us would look at that and think, hey, that, that reminds me of the med school uh, TB. There's a, ca there's, a, there's a cavitating lesion there in the upper zone. Um, the fact that there's hyaluradenopathy could represent that there is an acute uh, uh, TB process going on there. Th that's what it looks like to me. That looks like a really plump, uh, generous hilum. So I think, think that's what that is. Because yeah, the, this could be. I often get these confused whether it's a middle lobe pneumonia or just big middle lobe, a big uh, hyaluronopathy. Um, does this mean this uh, cavity that it's active right now? That this person not necessarily, not, not necessarily, necessarily, right? Okay. So you'll, I mean, and then you think about it. There's going to be a lot of people, especially older people, that are going to be walking around with these cavities. They're not going to close off, mm -hmm. um, and so you, you, it, it doesn't really necessarily tell you anything about the acuity of it um it's interesting you met you mentioned about that uh the hilum there um i'm no expert either and it can be very difficult to tell the difference between some infiltrate in the right middle lobe mm -hmm. um and hyaluronopathy at least for novices and they often go together yeah and and at least for for an, for an er doc i think that you know that's not 100 percent straightforward i agree so uh here's a, a sort of another example that looks some, that looks worse there's some little fluffiness over here yeah. uh, maybe this is hyaluronopathy again over here so again, this is another sort of another person that could have. They, I was going to say they could have TB, like any of them, but you know, could also be AR ARDS. I, I mean, there's so many things that can be consistent with this pattern, um, but you know, you're going to have to sort of rely on the clinical picture. But and we're seeing we're seeing lots of infiltrate there, mm -hmm. um, and I'd be really worried about this patient having a, an acute pneumonia. Yeah. So you know, there's sort of a ground glass pattern here. There's some infiltrates over here. This could be hyaluronopathy. So again, the important point we're trying to get at here is that the TB can look like a lot of different things. We are taught, and a lot of what we're doing here is the unteaching of what you're taught in medical school and other schools. You're taught these classic things, but that's not how things work most of the time. Now, this one is a classic. That's normal. <laughs> no, is not no, it's normal. <laughs> so this yeah. is the classic sort of millary tuberculosis right. pattern. Uh, the millet seeds, which I don't really know what a millet seed is, but it's small and looks like that. And it's all over the place. So this person is usually sick as hell, right? And we can tell they're sick as hell because they have a trach in. Yeah, that patient's not having a great day probably. But um, what you know what millary TB is, it's T. Bemia, TB emia. Mm -hmm. It's basically when you have these red snappers, as we like to call them, doing the backstroke through your bloodstream. So they, they're the same as viremia or fungemia or bacteremia. This is TB emia. And uh, those little uh, millet seeds there are the characteristic thing. I often wonder if sometimes when you're looking on our regular computer screens, if they have the resolution to quite identify these like the radiologist would like to have them. But from a practical point of view, this patient has pulmonary TB as far as I'm concerned that's contagious mm -hmm. as heck yep. and they have widespread diffuse TB that's in their bones it's all over until I've proven that it's not I mean this is a serious situation they're going to get hospitalized for that and isolated very sick patients we've seen many patients like this at the county back in the day so ladies and gentlemen boys and girls uh, the summary points is uh, TB could look like anything Classically, it's in the upper lobes. Classically, you get that cavitation. And classically, you have these nodules and stuff that are in your mediastinum. But it can look like anything. And you just have that index suspicion. You have to ask about, you know, where you're from, your travel, your HIV status, whether you've been incarcerated, these other risk factors to really work it out. And if in doubt, you have to work them up further. What's the sort of the classic workup? Well, I was going to say that uh, the classic workup... Uh 
if their coughing involves getting them in an isolation room and, and getting that sputum, doing a stain on it, sending it for culture, uh, it's very important that the public health aspects of this are addressed. You don't mm -hmm. want them transmitting TB to patients with cancer in your hospital. So that's really huge. What I was going to say also, I don't think the, com the conversation would be complete without this tidbit, which is that as you get more immunocompromised, so let's take AIDS, for mm -hmm. example, and as that CD4 count falls to 500, to 200, to 50, to those thresholds, the key thing is that they're more likely and more susceptible to TB at those levels right. as they get sicker, but you're less likely to see these dramatic things on the x-ray that we've been talking about. Because these manifestations on the x-ray are part of the inflammatory response to the infection. Part of the immune if response. You can't get an immune response, right. you don't get x-ray funds right. as much. And maybe just okay. to drive that point home, if a, patient is, if a patient's got AIDS and they're sick with AIDS and they've got a pulmonary infection, um, you could potentially have TB going on with nothing on the mm -hmm. x-ray. And that's probably the most important category to think about a negative x-ray being consistent with TB is a very immunocompromised patient with AIDS because you could be it could be silent on the x-ray. Fantastic. His name's Stuart Sword and my name's Mel Hubbard. That was the chest x-ray in TB. A very quick overview.